Hello and welcome in to a very very special video and as the title already gives away I got the amazing opportunity to talk to two of the Harry Potter 2 devs, one of them even was involved in HP 1, 2 and 3. So today I'll be joined by Mr. Gregory McMartin and Mr. Eric Gingrich and they're both amazing, they were super fun to talk to, absolutely lovely people and they actually shared so many background information to how the games were made and why things in the game were made the way they were. So this video will be the cut together version of the first part of first half of the interview I did with them. The next half, including them reacting to some speedrun tricks, will be up tomorrow on Sunday. Hope you're gonna have some fun with this and I'll go ahead and let both of them introduce themselves real quick and explain what they did at Harry Potter 2. Hi folks! Uh, I was lead game designer. I, I was I was brought on to work on Chamber of Secrets in particular. I think Eric worked on the first one and the third one, if I'm not mistaken. Eric, Are yes, you sure? I worked yes. on all three of them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was doing cutscenes. Yeah, but I was I designed the game. I mean, uh, I came in and worked with. The, luckily, the team had built the first game, so there was all these assets to work with, and so it was an awesome opportunity to work with the team to really make the best game we could. So we had, you know, we sat down and we just uh, worked. I, I remember reading the book and, you know, figuring out, parsing the whole story and figuring out what were the important parts and then working with the team to basically work out exactly how we're going to tackle, you know, adapting the story to a video game. We wanted to make the best game we possibly could. So worked really, really hard. Uh, dedicated about 10 months of my life or so. It was a really relatively short project, but it, it, worked, it went really, really well. And uh, we fired in all cylinders. And it, was, it was an awesome team. We all worked really well together. It was really quite... I remember it my favorite, one of my favorite uh, memories of my, in the entire video game industry, in fact, is working with the Harry Potter team on that project, on this on, on Chamber of Secrets. But yeah, I just yeah, I was a game designer. I mean, I just I, I worked to the team to help design the game. I worked with the level designers to design the levels. I worked with Eric to uh, help bring and make sure the story and the cutscenes were, were you know in, nicely integrated with the gameplay and um, worked been putting music up to the gameplay to make sure it all fit. I worked on game balancing to make sure that the enemies got more complicated. I mean, pretty much every, I had my fingers in every part of it I could to try to maximize the quality of the game. Uh, it was a really fun project. So that's me in a nutshell, the gist of it. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's funny. We all looked back on this game uh, for many, many years and we would text each other. The email alias existed for like five more years or something. And we would secretly email each other and go, man, I really miss this team and working on this game. So yeah, for me too, it was definitely one of the best ex game experiences of my uh, career. That's actually really awesome to hear, I have to say. Didn't know it was that uh, of a tight-knit team. That's that's amazing. Um, and and like I, you guys reunited today, from what I've heard as well, in the voice call after like 10 years. So <laughs> that's pretty cool as yes. well. Um, yep, pretty cool. Uh, in general, I, you've already said quite a few of the important parts, I think. Um, what, I, what I heard was short production cycle, which I that's the thing I heard a lot, that you didn't have much time making this. So how do you make a game in like, I guess, less than a year almost? Is it just very, very efficient or a lot of overtime? <laughs> both. <laughs> both. Yeah. Definitely both. Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, I was lucky enough to get sign off. We were lucky enough to get sign off from the, the game director of all things Harry Potter, who, who had the ear directly of, of the, the author herself. And I remember pitching him what I wanted to make with the team. And he was like, oh, you got a game you want to make? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like, okay, go ahead. So I took that seriously and basically started to sort of try to take the reins of where I th what I thought was necessary and essentially was able to work with the team to very the very beginning plan out exactly what we wanted to do and then get everybody got everybody's to sign off on it as though hey this is the game we're going to make and then we printed out a whole bunch of material and we had you remember the design wall Eric the big design wall with the chart and all the all yeah the, I have uh, that chart if you want to you have the chart still oh that's awesome I have it. <laughs> oh, that, that's the one you wanted to potentially show off. <laughs> It's, there's a photograph online of oh. a bunch of us uh, next to that chart. You can, if you can look, you can look up my name. You'll see. You'll, I think, I think I show up uh, in that photograph. Oh, that's cool. Um, I can only do a low res, but let me try to do this. Planned out the whole game, you know, with many things, many charts. But this was sort of the overall mm -hmm. chart of the entire game. We called it the game flow chart, amusingly mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to do this because. You know, there were so many versions of that main hub area that you have to go through back and forth. There were like 15 different versions of that. 
Um, so we had to kind of come back and figure out which game we called this. We made this thing called a game state. The programmers created it for us. It was almost like a Adobe Photoshop layers thing for uh, an Unreal level. I saw a question actually in, in chat earlier that I also have on my list, uh, which I think is quite interesting. Like when you made this, obviously it's, it's a big IP, right? Harry Potter, um, one of the biggest to probably work on at the time. Like how much freedom did you have with, with like the choices and the design and, and everything? Or was it pretty well, strict? Okay, so I can take that. I, I recall having to fend off a lot of producers and, I was, you know, like I said, I got the bot, I got the buyout. We got the buyout from the main design guy at the, on the EA side. EA was a publisher, so they technically had the power. But the main game design guy sort of said, "Okay, you run, run, make your game, make your game." So that essentially, I took that seriously, and so we were able to kind of basically splinter off as our own and make the game we wanted to make. Period. So we, you know, in putting together this chart, I think they were all impressed that we had a very specific plan, a very well planned out game. So by sticking to it like glue. Uh, and might be fending off any attempts from producers trying to come in and, and mess with it. Uh, we were able to have quite a, a large amount of freedom. I mean, we obviously we had to stick within the you know the IP. But there was an IP bible, if you remember, Eric, right? Where we, there, here are all the spells we had to work with. Here's all the monsters we had to work with, and all that stuff was prepared for us by the the author. Um, well, so we had to run things by her, right? It was this long process. Well, it may be in the, for the first game, yeah. But during the Chamber of Secrets, it was kind of like if, if we, if as long as we pulled from her, met, from her Bible, you know, it was good. Yeah, we could, right? We, we had we, established we it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, some people thought that was kind of constraining, but I, I recall at the time thinking that was actually empowering because as long as we stuck with those, and we could, we we were allowed to have our own interpretations for what some of these spells were capable of doing, right? Like like Flipendo was a, a, a particularly interesting spell because. You're like, well, what does Flamando do? It pushes things. Okay, well, what can we do with pushing? So a whole slew of puzzles came out of simply allowing the player to push things, and pushing buttons or pushing boxes into holes and this sort of thing. Um, I, remember, I remember it was really, really important for me to make sure that the puzzles were grounded in some form of some kind of reality and it wasn't all completely just random stuff, that there was, there was logic involved to them. So things like gravity and things like that were all taken into account so the players could think hard about how to solve something and then be rewarded for their thinking. And solving it. Um, I remember Vicky was... Rowling had a thing where it was like, well, he's only a first year student, so he can't have all these fancy, uh, you know, spells. So we had to be creative with what we have. Oh, we can just like push things. And it was like, okay, well, and we kind of took those and ran with it. Yep, yep. Or the the, the one that was like cutting cutting things, right? And so we had to like to begin with, what do we do with that? I was like, okay. And then we came up with puzzles where you had to cut things that would let things loose and. Um, it was a it was the one with the for cutting the plants, right? You learned it in the class, mm -hmm. the the uh, defendo, defendo class. Yep. Yes, that one. Yeah. yeah so each, each spell just sort of you know we tried to think about okay, what are all the possibilities that can be done with these spells in terms of the puzzle possibilities, and then we just sit down and try to come up with as many different puzzle types as we could for that. Someone said, uh, Clay Mandel said, Nick, so tell Gregory that I love him. <laughs> well, thank you very no, much. No, I don't Clay have Mandel. anymore. <laughs> that's, Perfect. That's wonderful. <laughs> There's lots of lots of stuff. People saying that they feel the passion in the game, and that also is really cool. Because yeah, we, we were really firing at all cylinders, right, Eric? I mean, it was like it felt like a, a pretty awesome opportunity in that moment to make a great game. No, with yeah, it was uh, a wonderful universe to be working in, and we were just kind of lucky in a way that there weren't a lot of games. They started making other, you know, uh, versions of the game at this point. We didn't work on those, right? We had nothing to do with those. Um, but we kind of started it with that first Harry Potter game, uh, and then this was a sequel, and so, and we didn't switch engines, so yeah. it was like for us that was like, oh my god, this is amazing! You know, a lot of game companies work on the same game over and over again. Had our game company it was a new game every year, right? So it was kind of huge to be able to be able to uh, you know build on what we had done. Yeah, I think that was really key. That that's really the key to the success. Is that the first project, from what I understand, was quite difficult. It was grueling. It was. A lot of producers coming down and stuff like that. It was you guys had to build everything from scratch. You had to build and conceive of and build all of Hogwarts and then all the characters and you know that in itself is just a gargantuan amount of work that was already sort of sitting there. So we could then for the second one just make great use of all of it and then implement everything in a sort of a, the way we'd want to. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a thing I, I had on my list as well list as well to ask um, because HP One had the groundwork laid, I guess you can say. 
but then you also changed and in my opinion improved a lot of things from it like the the, the way the movement works and uh, the spell learning mini games the quidditch mini games so how did you decide on like what to change was it like playing the old game and then realizing ah oh, this doesn't feel good and then changing it or how does the process what? work do you want to so the first there? game then on the first game you know so think about the time period we're in um, how many successful third person games were there at this point mm. not many right mm. i mean i might be misremembering but basically it was mario 64 you know before mario 64 came out i was like how the hell do we make a third person 3d game i don't know how to do it it's not gonna work blah 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 you know that kind of stuff um, so the first game was very much like, how the hell do we do this, right? Uh, and we didn't succeed yeah. uh, completely. <laughs> so the controls are terrible, right? Uh, some of that stuff gets changed last minute without us uh, getting anything to say about it. Uh, producer mm -hmm. at EA changed the controls, uh, how they worked, and then was like, this is great. And then I came back into play like, oh my god, this is terrible. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a cutscene guy, you know, they're not going <laughs> to listen to me. Uh, but we figured it out on Harry Potter 2, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that was really important for me too. I remember sitting down with some of the programmers and and getting really into the the weeds about like making sure that, for instance, I remember one specific thing in Harry, Harry Potter one. There was a thing where whenever you put your spell over an object that could have a spell cast on it, like a chest, that you would effectively just sort of see the the, the magical thing appear on the chest at a single spot. Mm -hmm. So regardless of where you were pointing at the chest, it would always be this exactly the same spot. And I remember being adamant that it was really important that actually the magic. You know the potential magic particle effect that's coming up moves with the cursor, right? So as the player moves, is moving their wand around things, that it that directly stays in line with whatever mouse is, or the controller or whatever. Um, and I thought it was really important to me. So the example of like, I, I yeah, I, I really wanted the game to be fun for anybody that wanted to play a third-person action adventure game, like that, Harry Potter or not, right? Um, that was super important. And I was like, one of the things that I never I remember about our reviews, Eric. I don't remember this, but. One of my favorite reviews of our game was one that compared us to American McGee's Alice, which at the time was kind of the state of the art third person action adventure. And I was like, if you like that, this is like the closest thing there is to that. And I was like, yes, yes, we did it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, uh, we won IGN Adventure Game of the Year, which was pretty freaking cool. Because at that point, yeah. those guys did not like kids' games, right? And they were just yeah, exactly. diss on every game we made, right? <laughs> and yeah. uh, that was yeah. just the, the vibe of the industry. It was. You know, we yeah. were all, you know, kids or whatever making games and we, you know, the, yeah. the games that we played were hard, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, when, when those <laughs> reviewers would play our games, they were like, this game's ridiculous, you know. Um, so this was one of the first sort of crossover games that, you know, also appealed to some of the hardcore gamers, I guess. There's a question here from Logan Barry Lowell. It says, question for Eric and Gregory. Do you guys love the Harry Potter soundtrack as much as we do? Hell yes. Oh my God, yeah. Absolutely. I, we were so lucky to be able to work with Jeremy Soul on that project. I, it was one of my, one of my coolest. I, I loved uh, the times where I got to basically match up some of the music and to some of the some of the cutscenes that Eric and other team were doing was one of my um, coolest moments to be able to do. Like I love yeah. the very the very very end where when the the cutscene of of when the, the when the the the, you know, the dragon dies and it's all slow mo and the music's all big and operatic and it's like ah yeah no it's. I think the music's a big chunk of the magic of the whole experience. Absolutely, it's part of the for the immersion and and really making you feel like you're part of the world. And I think he did an unbelievable job of making it almost feel like you're in you're in the John Williams esque Harry Potter universe. Like he mm. he's he's capable of writing like Williams, yet still it's his own style. So yeah, no, I'm huge huge fan of the soundtrack, and it was just a wonder to be able to work with that with those. Yeah, we would just sit there and, and listen to it, right? So as he wrote yeah. it. Um, you listen to it and then the first version was like synthesizer version which still sounded amazing right but then they got recorded with like you know the prog yeah. orchestra or something and then it was like oh my god this is amazing you, know? and you would just sit there and listen yeah. to it and then choose yeah. you know pieces for different parts of the game yeah. that we were making at the time yeah whatever fit best to what was what was what was what was in our cutscenes and what was in the, in the story in the game yeah it was awesome to be able to have that kind of creative freedom it really was it just it felt like we were you know in a zone an absolute amazing zone, and it's so it's so gratifying. I don't know. I, it must be for you too, Eric, to see all these people still playing it after all this time, and, and people still talking about it. And yeah, I, I, it's just no, I, I had no idea that this was actually going on at all. So this is a complete new thing for me. Oh, uh, like, you know, is it till, till you before get, like today we, kind of thing, Eric? Really? No, today, like literally, like you messaged me, and I was like, "What?" Oh, I, like, I don't know, maybe. And then I went out and looked at what you know you were doing, and I was like, "Holy shit, this is like so cool." Um, it's funny because, you know, 
I, you know, we end up kind of bitter after these making these games, right? And we're like, God damn it, you know, we worked yeah. poured our heart into this thing and nobody cares, blah, 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 you know. Uh, and literally back then, them. there was no way to have yeah. this conversation with anyone. So we literally, yeah. I personally have never yeah. had this conversation with anyone. I've never had any f fan feedback of any kind whatsoever. Wow. So this is pretty cool, guys. Thanks. I mean, oh, man. Yeah, you, you, you told, this is the only reason why I immediately thought of you. And I wish we could pull other people in, too, because the whole team needs to know. No, we should. Yeah, we, our should. Games get we should. Because it's crazy. Here, yeah. We can redo this yeah. for sure. <laughs> Not that day. <laughs> People are modding our game big time, Eric. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Like, That's amazing. Anything you can think of. I had no idea. Um, and actually, one thing that I hear from people that mod their own or do their own maps is always how difficult the cutscenes are, which is quite funny. Like, unironically, I heard people tell me that, like, you know, for a 20 min a twenty second cutscene, they took like two hours. Uh, what was it like that back for you guys? To as make well? one? Yeah, to make one, yeah. Oh my god, it was pain. <laughs> Pure pain making those cutscenes. <laughs> you, so we had a. So we had this script, right, that um, our programmers wrote for us. Um, and, you know, on the first Harry Potter game, I thought I was going to be making pre-rendered cutscenes. They were like, hey, Eric, you're good at, you know, you know how to do, uh, you know, movies and stuff. Because I had worked in the TV industry. That was my background originally. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. I get to work on Harry Potter. I make to get to make pre-rendered cutscenes. This is going to be fantastic. And then, you know, I'm working on them. I'm working out of it. Then they're like, ah, oh, guess what? We decided to cut that. And this is going to be in-game instead. And I'm like oh this sucks and then it was even worse than i could ever imagine because there was no way to do it and so they had to write from scratch this cutscene tool and i would literally just type in these commands hoping you know for this this thing to work and then you would have to like compile it and run the game and take notes to see what it looked like and you would literally be like oh, i gotta move it like two one real units to the left and then uh, try it's like your speed run basically it's like the pain of your speed run is like the pain of me making a single cutscene right what determines which cutscenes were unskippable because that's the thing we've as a speedrunner community been asking ourselves for a while because there's like i think four cutscenes in the game that you just cannot skip uh, is there like a reason for that or is it just i don't know just happened i don't know um it's always been the joke of my career thanks for making somebody in the chat made the joke already how oh, we skip your cutscenes <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're sorry about that in the speed <laughs> but, it makes but, sense for speed yeah. running because those are the things you but, can't yeah. change those are fixed right you that a lot of percent fixed so, time yeah who knows yeah. you know i don't remember why <laughs> <laughs> Some reason they're not skip. I would ex I would suspect that it was a bug thing, right? It was like, oh, if we skip this cutscene, that's going to cause a bug or something mm. like that. The only yeah, other reason I, was, I would I think gonna, is that, yeah, yeah, there, there will well, be ahead, some sort say, of information if, delivered, if, like, if you oh, could, you need these are the controls. Yeah, maybe if you could reveal what which cutscenes are unskippable, Eric and I might be able to then clue in as to uh, why. Th there's because we might know what the what. Yep, so there, there's for example the one, and I think those are probably connected, when you enter the Slytherin common room, so when you open like the door for it, and also when Harry enters Dumbledore's office, where also there's like the, the gargoyle opening. So it might be something with so like there were some bugs. objects. Mm. I think there were some bugs like that actually people could not finish the game, right? <laughs> um, because of some cutscene in the Slytherin common room, right? <laughs> Because we got like moms like writing letters, like sending in letters or something, right? We can't finish the game. We we had to start. Sort of like, <laughs> you know, we couldn't really respond to them. But um, I would imagine it would have been some sort of bug thing. Like, oh mm. man, if we skip this cutscene, it'll cause a bug. Because it was really hard to skip cutscenes, right? Skipping cutscenes is like the hardest code to make in a video game. Believe me, I know it because you uh -huh. know we teach this stuff now to these kids, and it's like, <laughs> oh, you want to skip the cutscene? Woo! Okay, well, that's gonna be a lot of work, right? So that was probably it. Yeah, because quite, you get all these questions of well, where does the camera end up? How, where, where does the player go? You have to teleport the player. You have to zap all the uh, all the all the characters that are currently in the world have to be zapped away. Um, you have to just do all this stuff, and, you have to, and so yeah, it's quite possible that it was just too complicated to skip some cutscenes for us. We did not have time. So okay, screw it. Just make that cutscene being unseeable. So we had to. There's lots of decisions like that because the project was so short. We had no choice but to make lots and lots of snap decisions. I recall lots of times where it's like we hit a wall, and I'd like go in there and, and say, "What do we do?" And I'm like, "Okay, do this." <laughs> Like do this, do this, do this. You know, just try to keep things moving, right? Because there's all kinds of problems like that would would would. would have. So yeah, the, you 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 know, a lot of these decisions just came down from having to make sure that the game worked for everybody. Yeah, no matter what. Uh, so since you're talking about deleted content, I actually know from the alpha build that we have that there were four different great halls built with the different house colors of the four houses. 
So was that also an idea that was scratched, that any of the houses could win? Yes, yes. I think I was the one that really wanted to have it so that other, other houses could in fact win. That's how it was designed. That's how I wanted it to be. But uh, that's an example of where EA producers came down and said no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like uh, the last the last the last month or so of dev, uh, I, the producers came in and started hacking and slashing and changing, and um, I think that's one of the many things that were were altered by EA. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, something similar to that. Uh, I, I recall Lindsay Gupton, who was the the head of the No Wonder Studio at the time, coming into my office and saying, "So I played this beanbag challenge and I lost." And and, yeah. another, and somebody else, another team won instead. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and <laughs> so it was. And there was this. There's a. There was this narrow sentiment, and this comes back to what you were saying, Eric, about people generally thinking, looking down on kids' games, right? That you know, this had to be easy because kids, kids are stupid and they don't know how to think and they don't know, you know. And I'm like, no, screw that. Kid, treat them like adults. Kids are actually smarter than you think they are. You know, the puzzles should be challenging. The game should be challenging, and it should be possible to lose, so that there's incentive to try to work hard to win. And that's like kind of like life, you know. <laughs> I think that's a good lesson to have. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, no, that you know, that just definitely there's, there's a bunch of stuff like that. Actually, um, another interesting thing is there was a whole different level, the final level, which right now is pretty much very small. You run by some fireballs, and then you have the big boss fight. Mm -hmm. That level was actually completely a custom level built by Phil Coe, who was the lead level designer on this project, who's now been at Valve for 15 years. He's worked on Portal, Portal 2, worked on Half-Life Alex. He's an absolute game design genius, level design master. And so it was a real pleasure to work with him. And he he built this level. I worked with him, but it was mostly him. Uh, built this genius level. Uh, it was extremely, basically it was the culmination of the whole game. So very, very difficult puzzles, very difficult enemies. You could die quite easily. It was hard, hard, hard in order to get to the end challenge. Um, and that was all completely cut, just gutted right out um, by the producers. Um, and I, I recall that being kind of an unfortunate thing, because I think that would have been a really uh, fitting end to the game as it was. Mm -hmm. It could have been a time thing too. You know, you can't put everything into the game. You know, mm -hmm. most of the... You know, most of the book is yes. cut, right? You can't fit it all on in, in you know. In the yes. Case that True. That's definitely part of it, for sure. About, like, thinking about how much time there is to polish it and things like that, right? So, and people thinking, oh, I'm getting nervous. It might not be a time to polish it and test it enough. So, okay, so let's just go with this because it's simple, right? For sure. Um, you know, that actually comes back to, uh, I have a question for the group, actually, um, about, uh, or even, even, even you, Nick. So, mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a few changes we actually made to the story itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and we did it for reasons. Uh, I'm wondering if, if anybody knows, can call out some of the core changes to the actual story itself compared to the book. Oh, like literal I mean, differences in what happens. <laughs> I mean, apart from the obvious ones of adding like the challenges where you learn spells for you know gameplay purposes. Okay, um, yeah, right, right. I mean, the actual story yeah, story, yeah, like yeah. cutscenes and stuff. We actually literally made changes to the story. Well, the, the funny thing about that, converting the story from the book, um, you know, we were working with Warner Brothers but Warner Brothers did not trust us with the script because, you know, mm. just some game developer people, right? Um, back then, you know, right. it's like Warner Brothers, one of their first few games, you know, and they're like, we're not giving them the script. So we had to read the book and figure it out and yeah. come together and cut and make it make sense, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, to me, like, I love that part of it. And what I really loved was going to see the movie for the first time. Um, after the game came out, you know, uh, and the movie came out after, I think. That's right. Maybe that's right. At the same time. But yeah. um, we go see a movie and they're like, oh, that's how they solved that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really clever. Oh, yeah. We did the same thing there. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's like, don't yeah. mind, think a lot. So I, mean, I felt very vindicated. You know, that's super cool. <laughs> yeah. And so the, some of the answers here Harry doing everything alone. Yeah, that's an mm -hmm. obvious one, of course. Um, and Harry going to the forest alone. Harry did everything alone. Yeah, that, of course, that was the gameplay. But there's actually a really, really major. Uh, two uh, two things that jumped to mind. We skipped the yeah the plane scene was a change. Yes, there was no there's no plane the way way we had it in the game. Uh, and we also skipped the entire going to the platform entirely. Right? It was like mm, they were at true. the they're at the they're at the bookstore and it was like we missed the train. Oh no! And they go right to the car. Right? Like we skipped a whole bunch at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But then the very very ending, the actual climax. Who can call out the mate the, the quite significant difference that we made? That we made the call. We didn't get permission. We just did it and put it in the cutscene. No one ever said anything about it. But it's like quite different. Complex beaver. Oh, snake oh. falling on book instead of Harry using fang. <laughs> yes, vessels felt better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is. Actually, I, guess, you know, I think we didn't have time for it, right? 
Wasn't no, that right, it was exactly. Too complicated. Yeah. It was too complicated. That cutscene I mean, was like, a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah, but no, I mean, yeah, that whole thing. But I remember, I remember sitting and talking about this because all we have to like, you know, all we have to like make give, give Harry a, the ability to pick up the thing, and then like, okay, this is all like days right. and days of work. So that kind that, of stuff. Right? Back yeah. then and now, that kind of stuff is hard when you have to interact with something in the world, right? Touch something in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and especially attach it and pick it up, right? It was possible, but it was just very difficult. Yeah, time consuming. Time we didn't have, you know, we just needed to think, we needed everything to be solved instantly, right? Everything was always just like, no, we have no time. It's always just go, go, go. Um, but it was cool to be able to have that kind of flexibility to do that, right? And then we synced it up to music, so it all seemed so, you know, it all, it all kind of worked, I think, dramatically. So no one, I've never heard anybody complain about that, right? It's just because it kind of worked dramatically still. And it's the same gist, right? It's the the, the tooth killed, killed um, you know, what's his face? The the, the, the proxy for the, the Voldemort. Book, yeah, the diary. Yeah, yeah, the diary. It, it killed the diary. And so, you know, mm. technically we, we, we stayed true to the book, sort of. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I love that cutscene as well. But when you say nobody ever complained about it, then uh, speedrunners would like a word. Uh, you, you might have read it in chat, but uh, there's only one vent that actually you can actually defeat it on. I assume that's the same reason then yeah. that like just the cutscene was awful to make. Uh, yep, there was only one. There's no way to make a multi. We would have made four cutscenes, right? Mm. Right. <laughs> so we're only gonna right. make one cutscene. Yeah, he's like, all right, right, well, he's gonna have to die over here at this spot. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's those are the things that you hope people don't notice. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, if you play the game like a thousand Thanks times, for noticing. <laughs> eventually, you'll notice. <laughs> it still works though. It just makes the fight a bit more difficult. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the funny thing. The I can't hear you. The truly ironic thing for me, right? And maybe for Greg, um, but. We worked really hard in the time that we had to make this game as good as we possibly could. And yeah, for, for me personally, like, I would try to break it every day, you know what I mean? Um, and, I, you know, well, I try, well, I would try not to break it when I'm making it, right? Um, but you have to try to break it as well uh, to make sure that it works at all, right? Um, and then in the end, you have a long testing period where you're just trying to break it, trying to break it, trying to break it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, for me as a game developer, it's it's like my worst nightmare that you guys are breaking my game, right? You know, not my game. I've just helped. But you know what I mean? It's like the most ironic thing that you guys are like exploiting it. But I love it, right? It's like this huge challenge to overcome, right? Uh, talking about the cutscenes, there's one thing every speedrunner also wants to know, and it's the beginning cutscene um, where Harry gets like taken from, uh, from the Dursleys, right, with the car. And there is a Hagrid lurking behind the fence and uh, we're not sure why he's there because he's not supposed to be in the cutscene and I, I wonder if that has a story I mean you know it's been 20 years since mm -hmm. I worked on that mm -hmm. um, but basically you would have to, one of the reasons that might be the case it might be a joke that somebody did right so there were a ton of Easter eggs in that game right mm -hmm. um, which I'm not gonna remember all of them uh, but one of the things we would have to do is and you might have found this room but there's like a room with like everyone standing around in it mm -hmm. um, Yep. off to the side like in the you know in the main hub and that's because those people had to be spawned in and ready to go whenever we needed them for a cutscene um so there's just kind of weird stuff like that that you had to do mm -hmm. yeah, the, the green room, room. or you call it the green room like, 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 yeah, we call it the green room. Room. okay <laughs> something like that yeah so this was the first part of the interview. I'll have them react to some speedrun strats and tricks next. So I hope you enjoyed this first part and I hope I see you around tomorrow for the second part of this interview. Thank you for watching. Have a good rest of your day.